Could you tell me why you were protesting outside York Minster? Yeah, <clears throat> well, we were there um, under the, the auspices of the United uh, Protestant Council under um, <clears throat> Pastor David Carson's um, uh, leadership. And the main reason we were there was to, was to protest, really, at the visitation of these um, relics, um, because um, York Minster is uh, a Protestant church with a Protestant foundation and articles of faith. And of course, uh, <clears throat> what they were doing in inviting those relics to York Minster uh, was contrary to, the, to their articles and contrary also to, to the word of God, to scripture. So we were there first and foremost well, to protest against that um, because that was the only Protestant uh, venue uh, that the relics were, were visiting while we were in this country. And then, of course, uh, the other factor is, of course, to witness, to, to testify to the truth, to remonstrate with people, individuals, and well, anyone who will listen to us, um, as to why they shouldn't, they shouldn't be engaging in such, well, idolatrous practices. And why shouldn't they be engaging in these practices? Well, one, because it's, super, it's superstition, uh, it's contrary to the word of God, it's contrary to their own articles. If I could read you um, the uh, Article 22 of the 39 Articles, which is uh, the Anglican Church's, or rather the Church of England's, its own um, uh, statement of faith. Article 22 says, quote, the Romish doctrine concerning purgatory, pardons, worshipping and adoration, as well as of images, as of relics, uh, and also invocation of saints, is a fond thing vainly invented and grounded upon no warranty of scripture, but rather repugnant to the word of God. That's uh, their own statement of faith, uh, which of course, well, by and large, they've, they've pretty much laid aside uh, in recent days. Um, but that's one reason uh, why they shouldn't, those relics shouldn't have been at York Minster. Uh, but the other thing, of course, is that it's, um, it's, it's contrary to uh, the word of God, <coughs> to Holy Scripture. Um, that's the essential thing uh, from our point of view. It's false religion, superstitious religion, forbidden by the word of God. And of course, when leaders, uh, for instance, the Dean of York or whoever was responsible uh, for the venue uh, taking place, uh, they are by and large leading other people astray. Where's the harm in that? I mean, they would say that they're not worshipping the relics. They're there to venerate them rather than worship them in that sense, and that it's a focus for their belief. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah, well, um, again, as I say, um, uh, the basis from which we are coming from is the Word of God, is the Bible, and and God in his word, he very clearly, clearly um, uh, speaks ag against it. Uh, Israel in the Old Testament made exactly, uh, made exactly the same statement. They said, well, we're, we're not really, we're building these high places and, uh, you know, we're, we're addressing the sun, the moon and the stars, but we're not actually, we're not like the pagans, we're not actually worshipping the sun, moon and stars. Um, or, or relics or anything else, idols of any kind, uh, we're worshipping the Lord through them. That was their excuse. But God invaded against them again and again. I mean, the, the whole history of Israel, uh, two or three times God um, washed his hands of them. Uh, they were sent into captivity to Babylon uh, because of their idolatry, their idolatrous practices. Um, <clears throat> it, it was no excuse, you know, uh, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, there the Lord um, uh, comes against them. He speaks about the craftsman who takes a piece of wood. He cuts it down from, a, uh, cuts a tree down. He molds and shapes it and uh, uh, an inanimate object. Uh, he says he takes the rest of it and he, he lights his fire with it. 
and then this other piece that he bows down before and, and worships it. And, and of course, he just, it, it, the, the passage just highlights the, how ludicrous, how absolutely foolish idolatry is. And um, so it's clearly denounced in the Bible, the second commandment, um, Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image uh, or, or bow down to the same. It is, um, um, you know, whatever these people say, it is, in terms of the word of God, it is idolatry. And so, <clears throat> what is your view of, of relics? Well, they're, they're of no, uh, they're of no value. It, it, it's, 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 as I say, it's superstition. It's, it's um, the man in the street um, um, walking down the street. A black cat crosses his uh, path, and he says, "Oh," uh, he says to himself, that, "You know that that that's good luck for me." You know, or uh, there are many, many superstitions. They abound in in, in society and in, in the general public, and. Um, and, and the worship of the veneration of relics is, is absolutely no different to that. But it's worse, it's heightened by the fact that it's, um, that God's name's brought into it and that they claim to be worshiping God through this superstition. That adds to their guilt. I mean, but if, if, they, if it's just used as a focus for that, for prayer, is, is that the same thing? Do you think? <clears throat> no, because um, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, said that um, um, uh, that that God is to be worshipped in spirit and the truth. God is a spiritual being. <clears throat> He's the, the invisible God. We, uh, we cannot see him. Um, when he gave uh, his, his commandments on Mount Sinai to his people. Uh, he said to them, he said, you, you, you saw no similitude, you saw, saw no likeness at all of me. They, they couldn't see him. Uh, there was no figure. And, and so you see, to, 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 to make some fanciful imaginary uh, uh, image and say this, this is God, it, it's like pictures. Uh, you know, people make pictures and, and, and movies and they, they portray the likeness of, of Jesus Christ. Well, nobody knows what Jesus Christ looked like. And to take a man or to paint a picture of a man and say, that's Jesus Christ, is total rubbish and nonsense because it is not Jesus Christ. Nobody, none of us knows what he looks like. None of us knows um, what God looks like. He's invisible, and Jesus says God is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, because he is a spiritual being. I mean, that brings <clears> into <throat> mind all Christian art, as I understand it. And, mm -hmm. um, what's your view on that? On Christian art? Um, well, uh, as, as far as, um, uh, you know, in terms of... of of buildings, cathedrals, and and perhaps um, you know historical events that have taken taken uh, place in 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 the past. Um, I, I don't have a, a great problem with it, but where it comes, um, where the idolatry comes into it, is when people start to make images uh, again, as I say, in the similitude of God. Uh, in the likeness of God, or how they imagine God to be like, or the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they bring God himself into it, that is idolatrous. Whether it be uh, people make uh, paintings, uh, uh, pictures of the Virgin Mary, and of course they, they, they worship that too. Again, it's nothing short of idolatry. If the thing is worshipped, venerated, that's idolatry. But, I mean, <clears throat> I'll come to the Virgin Mary in a minute, Jim, but, um, I mean, say, for instance, um, <coughs> some of the great works of art that depicting scenes from the New and Old Testament, and, and, and particularly those that feature <coughs> Jesus, uh, would you say those are, I mean, people are not there to worship them, they're usually there as a, a narrative to guide people? Mm. Yes, well, as I said, I, I don't have a great, great problem uh, with that, um, you know, a, a historical event, but as I say, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, portraying the person of the Lord Jesus, I mean, that isn't necessary. 
uh, say a film, for instance, it could be done. It could be done without presenting a particular person, you know, and um, um, any images. Uh, for instance, uh, our books that we we teach the children with, um, because we're addressing children, they do have pictures in. Um, uh, uh, picturing events that have taken place um, uh, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, but none of them, none of them have pictures that show anything that would uh, imagine God to be like, and none of them portray uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, because we just do not know what he is like. He's the Son of God, he's God the Son, and we do not make images of him. And just um, uh, could you explain what you were talking about in terms of the Virgin Mary? What, what did you mean by that? I mean, that people. Uh... Well, again, it's um, you know the the, the business of um, the business of the, the the relics being at York Minster. Uh, you know, to come back to that, as as the, as their own articles of faith say, it's a it's a Romish business and the. And the, the Church of England, um, many years ago, separated from, from the Roman Catholic Church because of many, many of its innovations and, of course, its, um, its idolatrous practices. And another one of which, of course, is the Virgin Mary. They, they worship her, uh, they pray to her, um, which, of course, is, um, again, is, is idolatry. It is... Um, it is it, it is blasphemy because um, because they they are offering prayer to to what is 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 no more than than a, a, a sinful woman who is who is now dead. She was um, a, a sinful woman. She acknowledged that herself. She said in the Magnificat in the Bible, uh, she said that she rejoiced in God her Savior. Well, why would she rejoice in a Savior? If she didn't need a saviour, she did that because she was a sinful woman and her son whom she bore into this world, who was the son of God incarnate, was her saviour. And so she was just an, an ordinary woman. Um, no, uh, uh, she, she, she was the virgin mother. Uh, we freely acknowledge that. She was blessed of all women in that she bore the son of God into the world. Um, in, in, in his flesh uh, but, but no more than that just simply a sinful woman like all other women uh, she died and she went to heaven uh, but she herself she herself would, would um, be absolutely revulsed by this worship that is offered to her today by both the Roman Catholic Church and certain elements within the Church of England too how can you be so sure that she'd be um, repulsed by all of that? Because she was a woman, and she was a woman who loved God, and who loved her son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, she was a Christian woman, and um, she would know. Uh, she would know uh, just as I know, just as as well. Anyone who who reads the Bible uh, would know. Uh, that, that she is not to be worshipped. Uh, there, there are instances in the Bible where um, men fell down before angels. I mean, she wasn't even an angel. She was only a woman and a sinful woman. But the Apostle John, for instance, was confronted by an angel uh, in the Apocalypse, the last uh, book of the Bible, Revelation. Uh, when he saw the angel, he fell down before it and he was told by the angel, get up on your feet, get off, get off your knees. Um, I am but an angel, a messenger of God, worship God alone. It is God and God alone who is to be worshipped, Michael. Nobody else, not Mary, not angels, not relics, or any, anything or anyone else. God alone is to be worshipped. What does um, Saint Therese mean to you? Sorry? What does Saint Therese mean to you? I don't understand the question, I'm well, sorry. <clears throat> I mean, people um, think that she was a saint, and, and um, as such, the Roman Catholics sort of, it's part of the sort of 
So does she mean anything to you? Right. That's what I mean. Uh, okay. Um, she, she means um, something to me in that she was... Um, in that she was uh, she was chosen of God to to bear the Son of God into the world. No, no, no. Saint, Saint Therese, not the Virgin Mary. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The the, the yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. 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 I go yes. back. Yeah, I'll ask you a question again. Sorry. Okay. okay yep. Yeah, no. Um, what does um, Saint Therese mean to you? Yeah. Uh, nothing at all, really. Um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, of course, has uh, um, you know um, estimated many people to over the years to be saints. Uh, the word saint in the Bible uh, means a holy one, um, but it means, um, it simply means a Christian. Um, there are many saints all over this world, um, you know, people whom, whom God has brought to a knowledge of himself and who have saved, uh, people who believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, for salvation. They are saints. Uh, chosen by God. Now, these people who um, the Roman Catholic Church venerates and uh, lifts up in this, this, this way and uh, estimates them to be saints in some special way, it, well, it, it is again another, um, another expression of the, the, the sinfulness of their religion because, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, their people are taught to, to, again, to worship and to even to pray to invoke uh, these dead saints. Now, um, again, this is just plain idolatry because uh, a dead saint can do no more for you than a dead Mary can. They're dead, they are gone. Uh, whether, whether any of them, whether this woman actually knew God or not uh, and, and went to heaven, I have no idea. But I know this, that speaking to her, praying to her, and even coming in contact, venerating her bones, uh, will do nobody any good as far as God is concerned. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, the Bible says. It is through Jesus Christ and Christ alone that we come to God. We offer prayers to God through him and him alone, not through any saint. And you, you're saying that <clears throat> the Roman Catholic faith is, is idolatrous and sinful. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, I can. It, um, uh, it, goes, back, um, it goes back to the time of Constantine, to, its, um, to its, uh, its birth, you might say, who he had some uh, mystical experience, and um, as a result of that, he declared himself to be a Christian, and... And from that point on, he legislated for Christianity, demanded that everybody uh, within his realm uh, would be Christian. And of course, that's not the way that the gospel is um, propagated and spread. Uh, the gospel, the kingdom of God, is, um, is extended by people hearing the gospel message about Jesus Christ and willingly, willingly submitting to believing on his name. Now, uh, when people begin to force religion on people uh, by legislation or other means, all they do is they, 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 um, they build a, a, an outward kingdom, if you like. It's just um, in word only. And it's from this beginning that the Roman Catholic Church developed and the papacy with it and, um, and uh, and of course its subsequent practices and one of the way of co one of the ways it's kept uh, an excellent way in which it's kept its um, faithful on board is through these um, many so-called miracles that they've claimed, um, you know, via the relics and uh, and Mary and and many other so-called supernatural events that they've claimed, which of course have been well have been demonstrated again and again to be, um, to be uh, um, absolute rubbish and nonsense. And, I mean, do you think, you, I mean, you said to me earlier that you considered the Pope to be the Antichrist, do you? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Um, the papal throne, I don't mean uh, the, the particular man who, who is the Pope at the moment or at any given time. Uh, simply, um, the papal throne 
it's spoken of towards the end of the gospel and of course um, the saints, the true saints, I mean the believers are, are forewarned of this, that um, of the, the coming of the Antichrist. There are many Antichrists but he is the papal throne is the Antichrist and, um, and, and of course I, well, I could back that up with um, some, um, some of the more honest and astute Roman Catholic theologians have, um, have um, you know, have expressed that view uh, themselves, um, let alone um, Protestant ones. Um, but yes, um, uh, we do believe that he is the Antichrist. He sits in the place, or he purports to sit in the place of God, to be the vicar of Christ, and um, uh, that, of course, he most certainly isn't. What do you mean by the Antichrist? Do you, I mean, it's... Um, he heads up the... Um, he heads up the... Uh, um, it's uh, the Roman Catholic Church. You have to understand has been, has always been a persecuting church, and of course that was heightened at the time of the Reformation. Um, it still is today, but um, uh, it was uh, it, it was uh, expressed um, at the time of the Reformation uh, in a most horrific way, uh, a, a terrible amount of of uh, the blood of of uh, Protestants was, was shed at that time. And it was clearly seen uh, then uh, the nature of the beast, if you like, was um, w was clearly seen. Uh, but uh, the, the 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 papal throne has uh, has always been seen to be coming against uh, the true faith. We've seen it through uh, periods in the Second World War, uh, its support of an, an annihilation in um, in places like Yugoslavia. Of, of the Protestant faith, that it, um, it uh, supported um, uh, Nazi Germany, Germany's Hitler. Um, so uh, in many ways and at many times throughout history, uh, the papal throne, the authority there has, has been seen to be coming against uh, the true faith. But again, of course, in the Bible, um, we're told that in, in the final uh, outworking of history before God brings everything to a conclusion that he will be he will be seen clearly to be seen as the Antichrist heading up the one world religion and of course you can see things moving towards that direction even now historical events and um, you can see things um, coming into place, uh, perhaps the advent of a United States of Europe, and of course as this European thing uh, develops um, into a, a one state as it were with, with many nations within it, many of them which are predominantly Roman Catholic, and we can see, we can foresee um, the advent perhaps of one religion uh, permitted within within that, that, that scope, and we can see uh, the papal throne as being the authority over that religion, heading towards a one world religion that will manifest itself at the end. And that's not a good thing? Definitely not. <clears throat> I'm still not quite sure what you're, when you say the Antichrist, does that mean the devil or? Well, yes, um, certainly, um, certainly driven by satanic, uh, satanic forces, influences. It's um, uh, Satan, of course, is a spiritual being, um, but to work out his purposes on earth amongst the human race, he needs flesh and blood people in order to, um, in order to, um, to do his, his business, to do his deeds. And of course, while well, you see it, in, um, you see it in, in biblical history that, that there have been uh, people that he has taken and used Judas Iscariot for one uh, to betray the Lord Jesus Christ, and um, uh, he was, uh, you might say, one of his instruments. And one of his instruments, um, another one of his instruments, would be um, uh, even governing bodies, um, uh, United Nations. Uh, or as I say, you know, perhaps United um, 
United States of Europe, that would be an excellent tool, instrument for him to use to bring about his purposes. And of course, the Antichrist is, um, well, is the ultimate uh, because, um, well, that will be seen, the Bible says, in the end, he will be seen to be the head of this world religion and it will be a persecutor of God's true people. And um, you mentioned Judas Iscariot, but I mean, the central tenet of your faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, presumably. Yes. Uh -huh. So in order for that to happen, then God must have planned for that in order to show people that there was the resurrection. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, uh, everything, um, everything that, everything that comes to pass, God has, um, God has willed, God, God has permitted. Uh, there's, Jesus says there's not a sparrow falls to the ground uh, without divine permission. Not a hair falls from our heads, but God knows about it. Uh, his will, um, um, but but it's set forth right from the beginning. God has declared war on evil, and and um, and God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through His death and resurrection, has um, has uh, has given to His people those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, has given to them the victory over that evil. God has declared war on evil. And evil is going down. Uh, whether it cares to acknowledge it or not, God, um, God has dealt with it fully and finally in the death of his son. What we're seeing now in the latter times, as the Bible describes them, that is times from the cross right to the end um, of, of history, um, is the final outworking, the death throes of evil uh, before God brings in his consummate kingdom the new heavens and the new earth and but what i'm trying to get at is that in order for that to happen somebody had to betray christ yes so in a sense they were doing god would you say they were doing god's will yes yes well the bible states that quite clearly it was it was according to um at pentecost the apostle peter uh, was preaching uh, to the people um in jerusalem and he said that um, he said that um, by the hands of of themselves, cruel and wicked men, uh, that they they took the Lord Jesus Christ and crucified him. Um, but he says he adds he says it was according to the the determinate counsel of God. It was predetermined. It was predestined. But and but where is Judas Iscariot now? I mean, will, is he able to be saved or? The Bible says that he has gone to his own place and from that I take it um, to mean that he has, he has gone to hell. And you don't see any hope for him, any, no redemption whatsoever? No. Even though he was doing God's will? Yes. And so... God, sorry, God uses, God uses, um, God is not the author of sin, he's not the author of evil. He willed it for his own purposes. Uh, for his own glory, in order to show his compassion and mercy and kindness towards those whom he had chosen. Um, but um, although God willed it, that doesn't mean to say that he's, um, uh, he's responsible for the evil uh, deeds of men. Um, evil is a reality with us, but God takes it and uses it. He channels it. He's not responsible for it, but he takes it and uses it and he channels it and makes it work for the good, for his own glory and for the good of his own people. So that the Bible can say in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good for those that love God. So, you, I mean, what you're saying is that <clears throat> Judas was, there was evil in him right from the start and that oh, yes. there was nothing that God could do about that. I don't say couldn't do, didn't do, but um, it, he was uh, he was a, a, a traitor from the beginning. It was known the, the references in the Gospels where um, um, it was known that um, he was a thief. Um, he had his hand in the purses, as, as it were, and um, um, hence, of course, the um, the um, 
the offer when it came, 30 pieces of silver to betray the Son of God. Uh, that's, that's what he chose. That was his evil choice. But of course, um, you know, I, I, I don't think until, until after the deed was done that he realized the enormity of what he had done. It was after that Jesus Christ was arrested, I think then that the truth dawned on him what he had done. And that's why he went out and hanged himself in utter despair. There was no way back for him. He was a reprobate. And can we go back to the Roman Catholics? Um, yep. Just because, I, I mean, would you acknowledge that there are good people, um, um, people that believe in, uh, in, in Jesus Christ in, in that faith? Or? Yes. Um, um, it, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, I think with the... Um, um, in, in recent history, the, there have been changes that have been forced upon the, upon the Roman Catholic Church and um, freedoms that have come to, to many people. Um, uh, and one of the effects of that, of course, is, that, um, is their access to the Bible, which, of course, in former times, they were never granted. Uh, their services used to be, at one point, used to always be in Latin. No one... No one understood what the, the priest was saying, and, and um, that, of course, had to change on demand. Um, they didn't want their people to have the Bible, uh, but they do now in many places. But you'll find in, in very poor, poverty-stricken areas where there is a predominance of Roman Catholicism, that even there, uh, today, they're, they're still not uh, allowed, permitted the, the Bible for themselves. But even where they do have access to the Bible, uh, Rome, the papal throne, uh, claims to, to be the only interpreter. Yes, you can read the Bible, but we interpret it for you. Now, the Reformation won the right for people, for men and women, to read the Bible for themselves and to come to their own conclusion, whether it be the scholar or whether it be the ploughboy in the field, no matter who it was the freedom of conscience for men and women to come to the Word of God, the Bible, and read it for themselves and come to their own conclusions without any interference from a pope, a priest, or even a minister. Um, that freedom, um, of course, has come uh, in the Western world because of education and, and uh, civilization, the development of civilization. And so, of course, they've not been able to keep the Bible from them. And where God's word is read by people, well, you'll find people coming to faith. You know, uh, they've not been able to prevent it. And I do, in answer to your question, I do think there are people who sincerely uh, love the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who are true believers uh, within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but my um, response to that or to them would be uh, that they should no longer be Within that system, they should come out of it because it is uh, an expression of the Antichrist. It is, it is a blasphemous and idolatrous religion and they should not be there if they truly love the Lord Jesus Christ. And could you not concede that um, <clears throat> the um, Catholic Church has, in a sense, held together the Christian philosophy and ethos uh, throughout Europe for since um, maybe two or three hundred uh, years after Christ died to the present day? Or? It was the only for, well, from the times of, of Constantine to, to the Reformation to the uh, early 1500s, the time of Luther, it was, um, it was generally speaking, it was the only uh, or the predominant expression of of the church and of course what uh, people called, what people referred to as Christianity. And of course, m many do, do so even today. And I, I talk to, to people in the street and, and, uh, and they'll, they'll come to me and, you know, thinking that they've got one up on me, they'll say, well, you know, what about the crusaders, you know, and, and the crusades? And um, 
and all the slaughtering that they did. And, and of course, my answer to them is that that was the doings of the Roman Catholic Church. Again, it was nothing to do with the true Christians. Yeah, so the, the Crusades, that was the work of the, um, again, that was the work of the Roman Catholic Church. But of course, that was, the, that was the main expression of Christianity in those days. And of course, when, when people, um, uh, people talk about Christianity today, um, by and large, that's what they mean, you know? And, and it, it's, it, it's a lack of definition, really, as to what a Christian is, really and really what the gospel is. And it certainly is not the Roman Catholic Church. Now, um, during that medieval uh, history, when Rome, as it were, was on the throne, if you, is, is the best way I could, could express it, within all that, there's always been God's true people. For instance, prior to the Re Reformation, there was uh, a group of people known as the, the Waldensians. Uh, they, they were in the, the Alps and, 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 and they, were, they were true worshippers of God. And, and I dare say that, that in many other places throughout the world, there would have been small groups of people who, who had the word of God and who adhered to the word of God um, and who were not involved in any of that idolatrous stuff and uh, under that papal authority. But as you say, um, in, in answer to your question, um, uh, as to it holding uh, Christianity together during that period, uh, I would say a definite no, because the only person who holds Christianity, and when I say Christianity, I mean the true faith, I mean the biblical faith, the only, peop only person who holds that together is God himself. And God's work, Jesus said that um, he would build his church and the gates of hell would never prevail against it. Never prevail against it, never overcome it. So God, even in the midst of all that conglomeration of idolatrous, blasphemous religion, the true church has always been there. Sometimes in the midst of it, and sometimes apart from it, but it has always been there and it always will be. And would you consider yourself to be part of that true church? I would, yes. And what makes you so sure of it? Um, my, my faith in the Bible, it's a, it is a, a matter of faith, um, um, but true faith, because um, uh, well, the Bible says, uh, tells us that we can know. We can know that we pass from death to life. Uh, we can know that um, we can know God. In fact, um, uh, Jesus Christ himself says that um, eternal life is knowing God and knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom God sent uh, to be a saviour. I know because uh, my own spiritual understanding has been opened, that was God's doing. He brought me to a knowledge of himself. He opened my understanding to understand, as it were, a spiritual book, the Bible, that I could never understand before. Um, now I understand it. And my faith is in the word of God and what God has spoken. Now that's the difference between a religion, whatever kind of religion. I mean, Ro Roman Catholicism is, is only one expression of religion. There are many, many others. Um, but the true faith is in the word of God and what God has spoken. And that is, that is where our argument, this is where our protest comes from. Because what was being done at York Minster, uh, the venue, the relics visiting there, and all this business of relic worship, idolatry, um, all these other practices, anything that is contrary to the word of God, to the Bible, because that is our faith, the word of God and the word of God alone. If it's not commanded in the word of God and the Bible, we don't do it. It's that, it's that plain and simple. Uh, our faith is in the Word of God. So, I mean, how close would you be to the Anglicans then in that case if they hadn't take, oh, taken the relics into your minister? Would you, would you feel close to them? Um, well, well the, the, there are some. Um, the, uh, uh, contrary to, to, to the word Anglican, I, I, I would prefer to use uh, the Church of England because 
there are other groups of, of Anglicans um, that have separated themselves from the Church of England uh, because of uh, some of their practices, uh, this one uh, in particular. Um, so so let, let's say the Church of England. Now, as I already said, that um, its articles of faith, the 39 articles, are solid, rock solid. We wouldn't have any argument with them whatsoever if the Church of England adhered to them. But they don't. And of course, for many a long year, they haven't. There's been a drift away from their 39 articles to um, back towards Rome. In fact, even at this day, as we're talking, that there is dialogue going on between uh, Canterbury and Rome. Uh, there's been an invitation made by Rome uh, for the disaffected to, um, you know, to come home, as they, as they would term it. And so, um, a marriage between the Church of England and Rome um, in the near future wouldn't surprise me at all. So, for that reason, the way that they've drifted, the way that they've gone. Um, uh, no, we wouldn't feel close to them at all. We, we, we certainly, um, we would see Jesus Christ and him alone as being the only head of the church, not the queen. The queen can be a member of the church, just the same as you or I could, um, but she is not the head of the church. That's Erastianism, and um, the word of God does not countenance that at all. The, uh, Christ and Christ alone is the only head of the church. So many of its practices, its prelacies and priests and such like, we wouldn't agree with and neither would the Bible. But having said that, again, you know, there are, there are people within the Church of England uh, who are true believers, uh, some who, who are, uh, they have some ministers still who, who are solid uh, evangelical men uh, who would hold to the scriptures. And, um, and, and they, of course, their point of view is that they stay there because they want to reform it, they want to see it changed um, and brought back to its 39 articles, to its original statement of faith. You say that the, the bones are just bones and they have no mm. um, religious significance or power or something like that, but yes. what about... Um, the bones of Elijah and, and, and the soldier coming back to life. Yes, well, I mean, there are, uh, there's that, that incident, and then um, there's one in the New Testament where um, uh, people touched the handkerchief of the Apostle Paul, um, and they, they, they were supernaturally, uh, they were divinely healed um, as a result of it. Um, I, I, I think um, uh, the understanding concerning miracles and the miracles of the Bible um, would be helpful here. All the miracles in the Bible are done, are performed for a purpose. Uh, at the time of Elisha, uh, it was a heightened period in, in Old Testament history, um, the restoration of the kingdom of God. Um, if I could divide it up, there are, there are epochs, if you like, where there is a, a predominance of miracles um, in the Bible. You have creation, where God supernaturally creates the world in six literal days. Um, the mighty expression of, of, of power, almighty power. And then, of course, um, uh, you have the, the flood of Noah, that was another um, another um, major event, as it were. And then, as you go through the the history, the Old Testament history of Israel, uh, there's the time of Elijah and and Elisha, and you see a predominance of miracles there. That's the re the restoring of, of of God's kingdom within Israel, and then the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, he performed uh, many, many signs and wonders, as did the apostles too. Uh, now, they're all, um, these miracles, um, these supernatural events that we see are done for a purpose. God authenticating, um, if you like, 
his servants, his men at that particular time. For instance, um, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. God is saying in effect, this is my son. Yeah? He comes not just in word, but he comes doing. He comes performing these signs and wonders, authenticating his person and his ministry. Yes, this is indeed the son of God. Likewise with the apostles, yes, these are my men. And this is God by his power, his supreme uh, supernatural power, authenticating his men, his apostles, who are the foundation, the builders of his church. Now, um, that having been said, uh, you see, from the time of the apostles uh, onwards, the foundations have been laid. The Lord Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the apostles, uh, their teaching, their letters in the New Testament. That's the foundation upon which the church is built. Now, after that, there is no, no further need, no further need for, for, any, um, for, for any miracles. They're done for a purpose, for a reason, not just done willy-nilly, not just done simply for people do benefit from them, but they're not just done simply for the benefit of people. They are done for a specific reason, authenticating God's servants, God's men, God's son. Now, the miracles that are claimed today, um, well, many, many people, I, I know, uh, even within the true church, many people do make claims about miracles. Um, uh, I, I would say, in all honesty, um, uh, the same to them as I would say to, to these who are engaged in this relic business. Because it, it's all nonsense and it's taking away credibility from the gospel. That the, There are no such miracles. Uh, the only miracles that we see today are men and women transformed in their hearts by the grace of God, made alive to God through Jesus Christ and brought to faith. That is a miracle of God's grace. Apart from that, I see no miracles of healing. I see, I see none of what these people claim, um, even those within the true church. Now, I say to such people, uh, they make the claims, so I say to them, well, okay, if you have this power and you have access to this power, do the same things that Jesus Christ did and his apostles did. There's a hospital there in North Staffordshire full of sick people. Go and heal some of these people. But they don't. I say to them, Jesus Christ was able to speak to the storm. He said, peace be still. And the elements were silenced, were stilled. I say to them, there was a storm up in Cumbria last week. Why weren't some of them up there commanding the waters, the elements to go back and preserve these people's homes and their lives? Simply because they cannot do it. They do not have the power that they claim to have. I say to them, don't just talk about it. Don't just tell me, do it. Do it. But they don't, they can't. Now, it's the same with this relic business. They make claims. Rome has been making claims. One of its one of the key factors in holding people um, is the Roman Catholic Church's claims to the supernatural, to the miraculous, and it borders on the ludicrous. Uh, you have um, the House of Loreto. It claims that Mary's house, uh, Jerusalem, in A.D. seventy-five was ransacked by the Romans. It was raised to the floor. Uh, they claim that Mary's house, that supernaturally the Roman soldiers were forbidden to enter her house, touch it in any way whatsoever, and after the siege, supernaturally her house was transported to, to Dalmatia, where it was worshipped for three and a half years, and then it was supernaturally whisked away to Loreto, in Italy, where it is still worshipped, venerated, uh, but of course, close examination of that house, uh, you will see that it's built of um, bricks that weren't even invented in Mary's time, and it has a chimney stack of which um, houses in Palestine in Mary's time didn't have. Many, many such claims. Um, 
some bones that they've claimed uh, were the bones of apostles or, or, or uh, even the Lord Jesus Christ himself have been found to be the bones of animals. Um, there are two cathedrals in Spain and both of them claim to have the head of John the Baptist. It, it, uh, these may be extreme cases, uh, but there are many, many such like claims that are made by them and they are just utter nonsense. It's a complete misunderstanding of what miracles are about in the Bible. The time for them has ceased. And the only time that I would see, I would expect to see a profusion of the miraculous of the supernatural again would be at the time, the second advent, the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. And do you have any uh, time scale for the coming, for the no, no, no. That's not in our hands. The Lord Jesus Christ says that um, uh, that that um, that that time is 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 in the Father's hands, and um, and no, we don't know. We we we're forbidden even to speculate um, uh, as to regard to that. I have no no idea whatsoever, Michael. And what about um, it, people? Um, certainly. Jewish scholars spent many, many hundreds of years interpreting the Old Testament and, and trying mm. to find meanings and different meanings and, on it. And, you know, it seems sometimes that the parables of Jesus Christ are often discussed and tried to interpret and stuff like that. Do you, what do you think about people that try and interpret the Bible in that way? Well, that, yes, I mean, that, that, that um, is... Uh, what the Bible's given to us for, um, to, to, to read and understand. But of course, um, you know, it, 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 it's a closed book. Um, you know, Jesus says, um, at one point he said to, to a religious leader in Israel, uh, he said to him that uh, he, he must be born again. And the man's name was Nicodemus, he was a priest. And um, Nicodemus said to him, well, in effect, he said, well, what do you mean? He said, how can, a man, how can a man return to his mother's womb and be born again? And he's thinking in terms, of course, of the flesh. He's thinking in terms of, of, of um, uh, human reproduction. That's not what Jesus was talking about. And, of course, he went on to say to him, he said, well, you're a teacher in Israel. You're a man who, who teaches the flock of Israel and you don't understand these things. Um, because, you see... Uh, where Jesus was coming from was the Old Testament. Um, he should have, th this man should have been looking for expecting uh, these things uh, to be happening, to be taking place. And so he said to him, look, he said, except a man be born again, that is born from above, that is spiritually enlightened, he cannot see, not with his eyes, but he cannot perceive, he cannot understand the kingdom of God. So the Bible really is a closed book to a person who hasn't been born again, who hasn't been spiritually enlightened. And of course, it's only God that can do that. But of course, that doesn't stop anybody coming to the Bible and reading it for themselves. They're perfectly free to do that. And I would encourage anybody to read the Bible. But you read it and, um, but you know, people come up with um, all kinds of fanciful ideas, um, all kinds of interpretations they put on it. But many of them, not all, but many of them are because they have never been spiritually enlightened. They're, they're reading it, if I might say, with closed eyes or with a closed mind. Uh, but for the spiritually enlightened, for those who, who have begun to understand the word of God, they read it and they interpret it for themselves. I have a, a small flock here and I teach them the word of God week by week. Um, I explain it to, it, to them and, uh, and, and I apply it to them and but it is for them. It is for them. You see, this is the difference between ourselves and the Roman church. The, the, the Roman authority says, you know, we are the interpreters of the Bible. We tell you what it means. Well, I preach it, I explain it, and I apply it to our people here. But it is for them. They have freedom of conscience. It is for them to discern themselves whether I'm speaking the truth whether what I'm saying is right or wrong, ultimately uh, they stand at the bar of their own conscience before God.
So they decide whether I'm right or wrong. Um, but we interpret the Bible. The Bible only has one meaning, Michael, not several. It, it, it's no good people saying, well, that's your take on it. You know, that, that, that's how you understand it. The Bible has only, any passage, any verse in the Bible only has one meaning. It may have a multitude of applications, but it only has one meaning. And you take everything in the Bible as being true? Yes, absolutely, beginning to end. So <clears throat> creation, Darwin, what, what's your take on that? Uh, no, Darwin um, um, was a, a, a poor misguided soul. Um, you know, he failed, he failed medicine at uh, uh, Edinburgh University and of course at a loose end and took himself on a world cruise and and um, looking at all these um, creatures in far-flung places, um, he dreamed a dream. And of course, it's uh, been the ruin of many, many poor souls. And it's led us in the West, not just he himself, but of course, many who have taken up his, um, his writings. And of course, they weren't even his own writings. They were, um, he was a plagiarist and um, um, he popularized the... Uh, uh, the writings of, of other people and of course um, uh, evolution has um, has taken you know taken off in in, in the West um, to to uh, to a great degree since uh, his day and now of course uh, our nation is um, is is thoroughly entrenched um, uh, in this evolutionary athe atheistic thinking. How old would you but, say the world is then? Okay. I would say. I would say, roughly speaking, um, about 6,000 years. Um, uh, you see, the, 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 the business of, the, the business of, of, of evolution is, is, it cannot be proved. Um, I, I just, you know, wish that people would be, would, would, would be more honest, you know. Um, it's a theory and, and, and that's all it is. In fact, I would say it was more than a theory. I would say it was a religion. And I would say, in our country at least anyway, at this minute in time, it is the most popular religion of them all. Uh, they say um, the atheist, the secularist, or the, the evolutionist would say to me, um, no, we're not religion, we don't like religion, we don't want religion, we, we've, we've left that behind, uh, we, we are this. Well, that's wrong, you see, because they, they are just as religious as anybody else. Um, evolution or atheism uh, is their religion. It's what they believe. They may say in their heart there is no God. They may wish that to be so. They cannot prove it concretely. They cannot prove it any more than I can concretely prove to you that God is. They simply believe it. That is their faith. That is their religion, evolutionism. Of course, it's not... It's not presented that way within uh, a modern society. It's put before as a scientific fact, but it is no more. It, it, it is. It is not scientific at all. It is religious dogma. Where does science fit in with your religion? It has its uses for good. And, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, discoveries are made, and um, people have. Um, you know, science has discovered things like uh, we, we've got, well, many, many things. Um, um, you know, the advent of, of television, for instance, or the internet, like, you know, it could be used for, it could be used for tremendous good, but, I mean, but also, also for tremendous evil. So science has its uses, uh, but it, it can never discover the truth. There is no truth outside of the Bible, outside of God's word. There is no philosophy, science, all of these things, they have their uses in society, but they cannot lead us to the truth. Science can never find, can never discover the truth. But, uh, I mean, would it be fair to say that you take the science that suits you and, and discard the science that doesn't suit you? For instance, you know, you, you say that, you know, you can scientifically prove about the house and the... Uh, Virgin Mary's house that those bricks didn't exist in that time, but you yeah. couldn't go with people saying the earth is, you know, was born was mm. several million years old or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, just um, uh, scientific fact. See, I mean, the, the business, I mean, take for instance the business of fossils. You see that the Earth, there are scientists who, who you know, uh, I, I know many men who, who can put a, a better case before you than I could, men who are Christians and scientists as well and um, very, very learned and very uh, clever men um, uh, who understand these, the, these things uh, much better than I do. Um, but take t- the business of, of, of fossils. This, this, um, this earth o- on which we live and exist has the marks all over it of a, 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 a huge catastrophic event that took place at some part in its history. The Grand Canyon, uh, the evolutionists, of course, the evolutionary scientists would say it took so many billions of years uh, to produce the to produce the Grand Canyon. Um, well, I know scientists who would who argue would argue otherwise, who would say it took one singular catastrophic event to bring that about. And the result of that, well, the the the, the catastrophe to which I, I'm speaking is is God's judgment upon the earth when he flooded the earth um, in Noah's time. And, and th- there are evidences all over the world of that event and, and, and of course, um, uh, how the world, how the globe upon which we stand is affected by that event. And many of these fossils um, uh, that they find buried in the earth are the result, are the result of, of of that event, um, you know that the, this um, the, they talk about their carbon dating, how they can date things, and uh, and again it's, it's a piece of nonsense. It's just uh, it's just pure guesswork. I, I remember in the Times um, uh, two or three years ago now, um, uh, the bones of a, a man were found uh, somewhere in, in in the Swiss Alps, I think it was. And uh, this was a front page spread. You know, half of the front page on, on the Times was taken up with this. And, and how that this was a tremendous proof uh, for evolution. They'd found this, man, this man's bones and it was so many thousands of years. They declared it was so many thousands of years uh, 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 old. And, um, and, and lo and behold, it was just by chance that I found it several weeks later in the inside of the times just a tiny little paragraph <laughs> declaring that um, a mistake had been made because a woman had come forward and uh, it had been discovered that this was the bones of her father who was lost in an accident on the in the alps um, uh, some 10 years ago or something like that you, you know so it's michael it's just pure guesswork do you ever feel that, I mean, you look at the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, you look mm-hmm. at the Church of England and the Anglican Church, you look at the size of their congregations. Mm-hmm. Um, do you ever feel that you're preaching in the wilderness to a certain extent? Um, well, um, Certainly, we are preaching in the wilderness. There's, there's no doubt about that. That, that's what the, the world is and like and too. Um, but uh, no, it doesn't. If, if you mean does it daunt me, then um, no, um, because I, I, I guess that the Roman Church has always been bigger and always will be. Um, it's something like over a billion subjects. Um, it's a state as well. It's not. It isn't just a. Uh, a church, it's a, it's a state, um, um, but no, uh, the, the true church has always been a, has always been a, a small, the Lord Jesus Christ refers to his tiny flock, um, he preached to uh, himself to an ever decreasing number of people, uh, in the end he was left with 12 men, um, so no, um, the true church is, is always there, always will be there, and it will always be in the minority. That's right through from the beginning, um, uh, throughout uh, 
the, you know, even the, the theocratic nation of Israel, uh, they weren't all God's people outwardly. They, were, they had circumcision and they had the prophets and priests and all the rest of it, but they weren't all the people of God. There was only, only a remnant, is the word the Bible uses, a remnant amongst them who were truly God's. And it's just the same today, and um, I don't expect it will ever be any different. Would you like it to be different? Would you like it to be different? We long to see people, I mean, there have been times when there's been, um, you know, there's, this nation of ours has been blessed of all nations. Um, you look at the heritage, the Christian heritage that we have from the time of the Reformation, when... Um, um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was virtually driven out of out, out of the nation, and and uh, there came a, a a freedom of religion within the country, and uh, uniformity in England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and and um, and then of course we had uh, times like um, uh, the Wesley brothers, uh, the Great Awakening, as it's as it's referred to in Christian history, and and many many people were in those days were added to the kingdom of God, the church grew and and grew. Um, and my childhood days in Glasgow, um, the churches were all full. Um, yeah, on a Sunday in, in Glasgow, it was like everybody had gone away, <laughs> they'd gone on holiday, you know, and the place was empty, the streets were deserted, businesses were closed and everybody was in church. Um, but of course, um, as I say, with the um, with this grip of evolutionism and atheism, um, we've seen a decline, a downward trend. Uh, but I long to see better days in England. Yes, and I minister to that. Um, I minister with that hope and expectation that we will see better days. How many people do you minister to at the moment? Twelve. Does that not? Um, well, obviously, it doesn't <clears throat> set you back, but it. it you know, when you see 12 people in your little church and mm. see hundreds in you know, cathedrals and churches, well, you know, do you not think, well, perhaps I've got something wrong? Uh, no. No, on the contrary, it does the opposite. Um, not that, uh, you know, that I delight in that there are only 12. I would that there were more. Um, but no, because, um, uh, well, one... <laughs> We started out without any. Uh, we, we started from scratch uh, here, and uh, we have 12 now. But um, uh, I, I, I think that um, uh, the majority of the people who come to us have come to us because they've been to these other places. They've been amongst these other bigger congregations, and, um, um, and they've not found um, they've not found what they were looking for, i.e. Uh, the Word of God. Do you think that, I mean, the last days, I mean, will people that have adhered to the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, the Church of England, do you think they will be saved or do you think they're beyond the pale? And hey, I, I, I wouldn't uh, dare to put anyone beyond the pale. Um, that that's in God's hands, in God's hands alone. Um, I, I I would hope. Um, I mean, please don't misunderstand me. We we uh, we were at York Minster protesting against this event, um, but as I I said, we were also there to witness to the truth, to speak to people who would listen to us, in order that they might be, uh, you know, convinced. I mean, we found a. A terrible, terrible spirit of anger amongst them. Um, uh, the, most of them, I think, safe to say, weren't weren't happy with us at all. But um, but I can only say for my own part, I was there to to share, to express the truth with them in love, in order that they might might see a better way. And for for anyone who is, um, um, for instance, if a, a Roman Catholic was to was to uh, or any kind of a sinner for that for that matter was to come in through our doors on a Sunday, I would be absolutely delighted, delighted. I, I long to see, long to see uh, many of these people, uh, their eyes to be opened and to see that, that 
what has been put before them is just superstition and idolatry. I would say, come, please come and listen to the word of God, the truth of God. So, this is what I find difficult. I mean, to somebody like me, you're essentially all on the same playing field to a certain extent. You're all worshipping the same God, Jesus Christ, the Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, but you seem to be saying that um, people outside of your church Yes. Um, really, they're not worshipping the, the correct God and, and they're worshipping idols. And, 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 and if that's the case, there is no hope for them. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, it would be fair to say if they remain as they are, yes. If they remain, uh, if they remain that in, 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 you know, adhering to, to that system. You see, faith, um, you know, the, the, there are things... Uh, assemblies, congregations, if you like, that the label church is put on them. But a church is a, a church is an assembly. A church is a is a group of people who who believe in Jesus Christ to be the Son of God uh, and God the Son, and to and to um, and who believe the Bible. That faith in Jesus Christ is not a mystical thing. Um, it's not a, an imaginary thing. It's believing. It's believing certain propositions. Um, it's an intellectual thing, Michael. The Christian faith is a reasonable faith. It's not a. It's not a mystical, nonsensical thing. But as I say, you see, all this detracts from the true Christian religion. It takes away our credibility. All these claims about the supernatural and. And, and, and the idolatrous business too. The, the Christian faith is, 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 um, is, uh, the, it is the, there are pro propositions that are put before us by God concerning his son. And even the son of God, Jesus Christ, his teaching, his doctrine in, in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are propositions concerning Jesus Christ that are placed before us. It is agreeing to those principles, agreeing to those propositions, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, believing that he died an atoning death for our sins on the cross, that by believing in him, our sins will be forgiven, and believing that God raised him from the dead in order to uh, impart new life to us. It's believing, that's what the gospel is. Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead. To the, believing those propositions concerning the Son of God, we would be saved. That and that alone, Michael, nothing else. Faith in that alone is what saves. Nothing else. I would, wouldn't you say that the Roman Catholics believe that? The Anglicans believe that? I mean, it, that central tenet of faith? And... Yep, it's the additions and subtractions that's the problem because... The minute you add to the gospel, you destroy it. Uh, I think it's providential, divinely providential, that at the end of the Bible, in the very last book, in the very last chapter, it says that if anyone adds to these, adds to, to this prophecy or takes away from it, uh, the whole prophetic scriptures, I take that to mean, um, their name is removed from the book of life. So it's the additions, you see, it's, the, it's, um, it, it's not the word of God and the Pope and what he thinks about it. It's not the word of God and transubstantiation. It's not the word of God and idolatry. It's not, um, it's not the word of God um, plus anything else. What God says in his word and his word alone is how he's to be, uh, is how he's to be worshipped. And those propositions of which I've already spoken, those propositions are in the Bible. And, um, uh, um, you know, faith by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is how a person's saved. But once you start to add, well, again, the Roman Catholic Church, another addition you see is good works. They say that a man is justified not only by his faith, by, but by his works as well. 
The Bible denies that. The Bible says that a man is justified by faith, faith alone, apart from works, any good works whatsoever. Do you think there's, um, I'm looking at the other great religions in the world, do you mm -hmm. think that's a different manifestation of Christ? I mean, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Islam? Uh, no, I, I think these world religions are, are um, uh, um, just another manifestation of man's sinfulness. Um, um, man is, uh, he can't get away from it. He's a, he's a worshipping creature. He was made for that, you see, and um, he was made to worship God. But when God isn't worshipped, then there's a vacuum there, there's an emptiness. And so he'll find something else to worship. Um, even the evolutionist will find something. But, um, but well, what I was going to say, I mean, Hinduism is one of the oldest religions in the world. It goes back. Mm -hmm. um, that was before the coming of Christ. People wouldn't have heard of Christ at that time. So no, but he was there in the Old Testament. He was still proclaimed. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, Hinduism is is probably um, uh, the oldest. Um, Islam would be probably the youngest, um, um, uh, but as I say, it's just an expression. Um, uh, Hinduism is, uh, um, finds its expression today in the West in, in what they call the, the New Age movement. It's uh, God is everywhere, God is everything, there's a multitude of gods. And of course, well, if there's more than one God, then who who's who's the chief one who's the top one you know who calls the shots you know it's a, there can only be one god um but they're all just um they're all just a, a manifestation of the sinfulness of man his need to worship if he doesn't worship god the true and living god he'll find something else to worship the sun the moon the stars himself um or a, a multitude of other things <clears throat> what about people that will not come into uh, contact with Christianity um, by geographical mm. uh, boundaries? Yes, um, that's, um, that's why we send out missionaries, um, because um, the word of God has to be pro propagated throughout the world. Uh, the last commandment uh, the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his apostles was to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That, of course, um, is a commandment that still stands. It's a commission given to his church. And um, we still, of course, uh, we, we do that. We send, um, we send missionaries um, uh, out into the far reaches of the, the country, not as many now as we once did, but we still send people out into other parts of Europe, other parts of the world, uh, to, to, to spread the gospel. Um, of course, with... Uh, uh, the advent of uh, modern technology, uh, we're able to uh, to do that in in other ways as well. Uh, for instance, we we send the gospel from this tiny little chapel. We send it out into the four corners of the world via the internet. We have people who listen to our services uh, every week uh, in the United Arab Emirates, in Thailand. Um, in Pakistan and in India, United States of America. Uh, we, have, we have a monthly report of our services that are listened to and in all, all parts of the globe. So the gospel is to be preached in all the world and to as many people as will listen as we can lay hold upon. Um, that's still our commission and that we're still engaged in. One <clears throat> last thing, Jim, I'm just thinking about the mass. The, all right. Um, uh -huh. Could we talk about um, your disagreement and differences with the Mass? And, I mean, both in the Anglican and uh, or the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church and, and yourselves. Okay. Um, well, starting with, with ourselves, it's, um, uh, we celebrate uh, on a monthly basis, uh, once a month, the first Sunday in the month, we, we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. We don't call it uh, the Mass. Um, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's, it's plain... It's very plain, it's very simple. Um, uh, we break the bread that's distributed amongst the congregation. They all partake and, um, and we pass the cup around and everyone uh, drinks the wine. It's plain, simple, as I say, 
um, uh, ordinary bread and wine, and it remains that way throughout. Our protest against the Roman Catholic Church, of course, with its mass, is that that too, of course, is blasphemous, in that uh, they uh, state, they say that the um, uh, by the words of the priest, uh, that the the elements of the bread and wine are transubstantiated, that is, they are changed into the very real body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, to such an extent that the, the wafer, the host, as they call it, uh, the priest even lifts it up, and um, they believe that that, that is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ to such an extent that the congregation are bidden to worship it. Again, that takes you into the realms of idolatry. Again, it's, uh, it's superstition. It's, um, well, it's one of the battles, of course, that was fought at the time of the Reformation. And um, um, it is, well, as again, I, I, I say uh, superstitious nonsense because the bread doesn't change, the wine doesn't change. Uh, another aspect of this, of course, would be that the congregation in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they don't partake of the wine uh, because uh, the blood of the Lord Jesus is purported to be in his, um, in his body, which is in the wafer, in the, in the host, uh, that they worship. Only the priest, um, he alone, is uh, allowed to, um, uh, to drink the wine. But it is um, it is uh, it is uh, it is blasphemous because they are worshiping an idol. It is not the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospels, when um, when the Lord Jesus said to his apostles in the uh, Last Supper, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, and he said, "This is my body, which is given to you," meaning. This is a representation of my body, not my actual body. He didn't dig into his flesh and pull a bit out and say, this is my body, yeah? which would be, of course, ludicrous and vulgar, to say the least. Um, it was What he meant simply was, this is my body, this is a representation, this bread is a representation of my body, and this wine uh, in this cup that I pass to you is a representation of my blood that will be shed very soon on the cross. Now it's the same, you've got other passages of scripture where Jesus says, I am the door. Yeah? He doesn't mean he is literally a piece of wood. He means he is, he represents the door, the entrance into the kingdom of God. We don't take that literally, you know? But they take a literal interpretation, they say, this is my body. So the priest takes the wine uh, sorry, the, 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 the wafer, the host, the bread, he lifts it up and he says, this is my body, and it supposedly, supernaturally um, changes into the actual, real body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even to such an extent that they can take it, um, uh, they even carry it in processions, and as they take it uh, in their processions, it is again worshipped, it is uh, idolatry. Now there are parts, you asked about the Church of England, um, uh, there are Anglicans of course who would, um, who would take exactly the same view as I have just expressed. Um, they would see uh, the Roman Mass as being blasphemous, but of course you have, uh, there is such a mixture within the Church of England now, uh, high Anglicans and well, they, they, they are virtually more or less uh, Roman Catholics, and so they would celebrate the Mass too, um, equivalent to, to that of Rome. But in a phrase, in a word, it is, um, it is blasphemous and idolatrous. So I would just like to say in conclusion that um, uh, to anyone who was at York Minster and, and these, these many people who who were angry with us because we were there protesting and, 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 and seeking to witness to the truth. It, it's an incredible thing to me that, that what seemed to me at least anyway to be uh, reasonable, intelligent people, that they could, um, that they could subscribe to this, um, 
this superstitious nonsense. Uh, and, I, and I would just, my plea to them would be to, to turn to and to read the word of God for themselves. God has given us his, his word, the Bible, and, um, and we have free access to it in this country. We're not, uh, we're not hindered from it in any way whatsoever. And I, I would ask them, rather than be angry, to, to be reasonable, you know? Um, God says in his word in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, he says, come now and let us reason together. There's an invitation from the Lord himself to reason with him. Come to his word and listen to what he has to say about the matter. Let me give you just one or two verses to conclude with. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. A departure from God to idolatry, um, that's the New Testament. It's forbidden. It's forbidden. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? Would you compare God to a set of bones, a woman's bones who's deceased some hundred years or more? Would you say that's what God is like? To subscribe power to such supernatural power to a set of bones, surely, surely is, um, is a departure from God and is a despising of the true and living God. And then finally, in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 15, uh, speaking through Moses, God says, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. No likeness, no similitude uh, whatsoever, because God is a spiritual being and he is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And here's the saddest thing of all, is that when a nation's religion becomes false, idolatrous, false, then that nation is dead. The gospel, the word of God, that was recovered, restored at the time of the Reformation, came to this country of ours, and it set this nation free. We were in bondage, religious bondage, political bondage, uh, economic bondage. Uh, the gospel of the Reformation came to this nation and set us free. It gave us economic freedom, religious freedom, political freedom. It set this nation free and we prospered. And this nation became Great Britain. And this nation took the same gospel to the United States of America and built a huge, great nation there, a free nation. Everywhere you see the gospel, you will find freedom. But where you find idolatrous, blasphemous religion, you look to the third world countries, you look to South America, you look to nations that are predominantly Roman Catholic, or Islamic, and you will find nothing but bondage, dysfunctionalism, you will find nothing, n nothing, no freedom whatsoever. It is the gospel, it is the word of God alone that sets men and women free. I ask you to come to the word of God and read it for yourself. See that these things are so, and worship God as Jesus Christ said he should be worshipped in spirit, and in truth. Martin Luther was the father of the Reformation, I think. Would that be fair to say, do you think? Yeah, he, he, he's the man who kick-started it. Um, he, um, he was a man, a man looking for peace, um, uh, peace with God, that is. He, he, he was troubled in his mind, conscience, and uh, of course, he was he was a Roman Catholic priest, and um, he he joined a monastery, and um, and he did all the things that they did in monasteries in those days. Um, uh, he he paid his money and um, flogged himself and um, 
penances uh, of a whole variety. Um, he was so in body, he was so emaciated at one point that um, I think some of his friends thought that um, his his demise was um, was uh, was very likely. Uh, he he had so abused himself, but th this was all to this was all to find peace with God. And um, it, it, but it wasn't until um, uh, he, he he discovered in, in in the book of Romans in the Bible that it was by faith and faith alone that God justified a man, uh, gave a man peace with God. He tried even the ultimate. He went to Rome, and as he entered into uh, the city of Rome, he was absolutely appalled at what he saw. The the the, the degeneracy, the the vice. He thought it was. He thought he was going to a holy city, and he was absolutely appalled at what he saw, at the at the um, the degeneracy, and not just the common people, but the religious hierarchy. It was absolutely disgraceful. And the ultimate, of course, was to climb the the steps up to the Pope's um, resting place uh, on your hands and knees. That's the ultimate penance. Um, but as he did that, the words from the Bible, from the book of Romans, came back to him again for the third time. The just shall live by faith. And that's how Martin Luther was set free. He came to realise it wasn't, it wasn't by religious practice. It wasn't by um, penance. It wasn't by uh, papal authority. But God's authority in his word um, the just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther was set free. Uh, he, if you like, uh, recovered the doctrine of justification by faith and faith alone. And of course, he began to uh, teach that. He began to um, preach it um, in his native Germany, much to the consternation of the um, uh, uh, Roman authorities. Um, uh, but they were never... In God's providence, they were never permitted to um, to, to lay a hand on him. Um, but yes, he kick-started the, the Reformation, and of course it spread throughout the entirety of Europe, and as I said earlier, uh, to the United Kingdom, uh, Great Britain as it became, and then of course to the United States of America also. He never left the Catholic Church, though, did he? No, they deposed him. Um, yeah, no, it was um, the separation, um, you know, was, is, um, uh, the separating was done, was done by Rome. I mean, it, 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 set, in, it set in process a, a terrible, fierce persecution. As I say, Mar Martin Luther himself, he, he escaped, um, I mean, he was persecuted, but um, I, what I mean is not, not to, to, to the point of death. But many, many others, many of his, his uh, supporters, many of, of those who, who followed his, his doctrine certainly were. And then, of course, as it moved into France in the time of uh, uh, John Calvin, who was a major uh, theologian in the Reformation, uh, his native France, the uh, blood ran freely of Protestants who, who withstood stood Rome. So... Um, um, uh, if there's um, uh, guilt um, there, if there's um, uh, a finger to be pointed at in, in, in these terms, then it most certainly is Rome because um, it shed the blood of many, many of those dear saints uh, in the time of the Reformation. St. Bartholomew's Day in, in Paris, the blood of Protestants ran through the city, ran through the city. And none of these things have been, I mean, R R Rome uh, keeps calling on the Church of England on, on uh, uh, you know, uh, Protestants to come home because she's the mother church, you know, to repent and come back. If anybody needs to repent, it's the Roman Catholic Church that needs to repent of the blood it shed, and especially so during the times of the Reformation.